Let me tell you why you're here. You're here because you know something. What you know you can't explain, but you feel it. You felt it your entire life. Can find record, Brando. Hats. <laughs> there you right. going? Yeah, okay, but okay. Hey, thanks. That's good. That it, I'm not going to put that part in, so that's going to sound like I've got the shits. Uh, Hats. <laughs> anyway, yeah, lovely, lovely. So we um, it's the second time today we've had a, a little zoomy zoom. We that's true, but the first one was with a solid Bitcoiner who doesn't who's who's left the world of being known and yep, yep. publicity and all that kind of stuff. And he's yep. just working hard, which was a good, good conversation, but we'll not talk about him. No, uh, but it was but, good though. But I love that. This guy's oh, totally. That. But that's the first time I think, as I said to when we were having a chat, the first time we've actually sat down, set it up, had a chat for an hour and a half. Yeah. And not recorded it. Yeah. Is that not right? Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. With both of us, definitely. No, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, but we do have a, we do have a guest. On it. One, one of our favourites, who, who's who, who's whose whose ego is almost as big as ours. Before um, before we do before we do right. So whenever I have sort of normie friends or family or whatever sort of inquiring right, yeah. and I send them some of our pods. Yeah. I at the moment I'm sending them two. I send Katan's Katan. a Bitcoin glossary. Yeah. And for the pure bullishness, I send them Pete Dunworth. Yeah. Hello, Pete. Good to be here with you, boys. It's I'm... always fun. So, <laughs> and, and you know what? I sent it to my brother because he was driving home. Because my sister's here, he's driving home to Toowoomba, and I sent him those two. And I said, you know, a long drive. Yeah, 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 totally. And I'm, he listened to both. And I said, do you get any value from those pods? And all I got was, you've got a, a crush on the financial guy. <laughs> <laughs> well, everybody does. Everybody does. And I didn't dispute it. Yeah, but I love Keith Katan. So there you go. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> Nearly called him Key Tan. I don't know what happened right. there. Um, so, hi, Pete. How are you, bud? Life is beautiful. Good to be here with you. Well, you say that. <laughs> you say that, Pete. Right. <laughs> but um, let, but but so let us start. Let us start here. Brendo has had an idea. Okay. This and this, I just have to get that across first. This is all Brendo's idea. <laughs> I don't even know where, you, where you're going, but go. Um, Better be but, good. But um, so um. You, I think I'm right in saying you've you've been a Bitcoin for a while, right? But you've only really been a public Bitcoiner for maybe, maybe probably maybe less than a year, is it? Yeah, that's and right. very and recently, you know, quite public, right? Yeah. But um, but you have a message, and we were the last time we spoke. You really wanted to, you want to be challenged on your message. Yes, on the valuation framework. Yes. Yeah. Nice. You really want to be challenged, so um. So as I say, this is all Brando's idea, but you can make it up. You are making it. So, up. so we have somebody sitting, waiting in the green room to challenge your idea. <laughs> awesome! Brilliant. Are you are you up for your idea being challenged? <laughs> we are just, just we're dropping this on Peter right now. So, are you up for being challenged, Peter? I love I love this. I've just got visions of this, you know, this white dove that I'm just throwing into the air of hope and. The bloke in the green room just with a big, you know, gun turret going. Dick, 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 dick. Are right. you are you ready to meet your nemesis? I would love that. Here he comes. Hopefully, no connection issues. Oh, please don't be a connection. And issue. he's still there. Hey. Oh! <laughs> so who we got? Oh, Michael yeah, Dunwood. Yeah, oh, what's happening? Oh, <laughs> do you know do you know what's uh, better than a Dunworth? Two Dunworth. Oh man, dude. Dunworth squared. How good. Oh, well, good. Hey, guys. Good, mate. How are you? Better now, mate. Hey, good, good, good. I'm really disappointed. He maintained his composure beautifully. Yes. <laughs> Hats, Hats was actually saying this morning, he goes, oh, look, can you like screen grab Pete's face? Like when we drop this on him <laughs> to see if he was going to be shocked or something. <laughs> that might good, be, he's got a good poker face. The, the, the thumbnail for the next episode. Yeah. Me like, oh. <laughs> Perfect YouTube thumbnail. Uh. All right. So have you guys ever been on a pod together? Nah, nah. World, world exclusive. There you go. Oh wow! Two billions. 
So, so we are not challenging your idea, Pete. Your idea is bang on. There is no challenge in the idea, and that is why nobody's stepping up to challenge your idea. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but on, what... on, on a serious note, I haven't had any serious pushback on that. Yeah. I'm like, follow the bouncing ball, and we get to the number, which is stupid, and that's why you know I don't like saying the number. But um, literally, I haven't had any meaningful feedback that seven billion dollars disputes it. Yeah. So. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm still waiting. So, yeah, maybe we get on to some smart Keynesian economists or the Reserve Bank governor and get him to come in or her to come in and give us yeah. a lesson in economics. But, uh, yeah. All, all, we, all we actually wanted to do was, like, sit around the breakfast table at the Dunworths Yes. And see just to see how just to see how that actually goes. I know. Um, so so we're just gonna take a back seat tonight, boys. And we're gonna start a couple of topics and just see where you go. Yeah. Um we may leave. Brenda'll probably go smoke and pee in the garden. I'll just stay here with the dog. Um, and and can you pass the peas and mash, please? We probably no. have we probably have three questions. Knowing you boys, I reckon we'll get through one of them. Um <laughs> and we'll just go in whichever direction you want to go. Is that is that okay? Is that all right? Good for me. Yeah, awesome. Good. I just like to say, Michael is such a sweetheart. He's been asking me, "Are you sure he's going to be okay with this? Yeah. Is this definitely okay? You're not trying to ambush him." <laughs> like, I was like, "Michael, it's okay. it's okay." I don't want a sandbag. That's all. <laughs> hey, what the fuck are you doing here? <laughs> <laughs> like some some family feud we weren't aware of. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that would have been awkward. How <laughs> funny would that be? <laughs> oh, very <laughs> good. <laughs> Um, uh, all right, shit. No, nah, it's right. all good. Right, here's where I'm going to start, guys. Okay, I'm going to start on exponentials, right? Because I know both of you fully understand that issue. Um, so here's the thing: we have a Bitcoin price that we think is going to, at some stage, right, and maybe is already rise exponentially. Right, we probably have a fiat world that's going to fall exponentially as well. So what I really want to talk about is, um, are, do they do they are they a complete mirror image of each other, or does one go first? And if one goes first, and I don't want to bias this with my opinion, but what does that mean for people's positioning? I want this. For, I want this to be fun, but it, just sensibly for folk. Um, I don't want any. I, I hate the idea of somebody just being so bullish on Bitcoin and they just screw themselves over. Um, so what is that? Can I, what's your opinion on that? Hey, uh, I, I think, you know, obviously we're all very bullish on Bitcoin. I think before we get into the bullish chat, basically only put in what you can afford to lose or what your study has led you to believe is a good allocation for you personally. I think, you know, the more I study it, the more I want to put money into it. And this is the first time out of any asset that I've seen, you know, the more I study it, the the better it gets rather than the alternative. Typically studying something uncovers a whole host of vulnerabilities or risks that you otherwise wouldn't look at unless you stared at, at the problem for, you know, a thousand hours. And this is where, you know, I'm only an amateur compared to Mike. And I think, you know, I would have been staring at this problem for 10,000 hours and I still can't find a genuine problem that would undermine its long-term validity and as such um, and sort of putting a finance focus over the, you know, what we do, uh, there's a, a key distinction between risk and volatility. Now this thing's really, really volatile, but at the same time, I believe it's a risk-free asset. And, you know, this is really hard for most people to hold two thoughts in their head at the same time that they think are the same thing, but risk and volatility couldn't be further from each other if you really understand what they are. So um, for me, I think it's important to distinguish between those two and then understand that what you're buying is uh, probably not what you originally thought it was. So, Mike, I might hand over to you. No, no, I think that makes sense. And I think there's sort of two sides to the coin. So there's a very, like, data-driven side, which is right now it's really hard to argue with Bitcoin as an investment. And so I think from like a return on money, you would get the most going to Bitcoin. But coming up to sort of the what we're actually coming up to, which feels like an absolute just shit storm for people, where it feels like, you know, mortgages are going to go or houses. It's, it's sort of like I feel like everyone's kind of being whittled down from their lifestyle that they had 
pre-COVID and then there's this post-COVID lifestyle, which has got a lot of less bells and whistles because everything's gotten harder. So I don't know. It's weird. Like I reckon everyone should pile in, obviously, but I'm not a financial advisor, so I wouldn't say that because everyone can pile would. in and it's probably going to be <laughs> the best ROI that you'll get financially. But you can't pile in if it means that you don't have a roof over your head. We're human beings, so we have very like obvious necessities. So one, we need to sleep somewhere that keeps us safe. Two, we need oxygen. Three, we need water. And then obviously food. But but yeah, like so I think because I've had like, for instance, a friend that has saved a lot of money and he's like, oh, should I buy Bitcoin? Like I want to, you know, he's trying to grow his wealth or whatever. It's like, well, yeah, but where are you going to live? And then it's like, oh, because, you know, I'm in an between a property and Bitcoin. And so, you know, I, I don't know if it's like, it's hard to say pour everything into it if you haven't established some basic needs have been met kind of thing. So, you know, I think I think it's always circumstantial, but I think the the, the biggest thing is that, People are now like when the economy is going better, people have to compromise between Bitcoin or some, you know, other luxury. But when the economy is hard and times are really tough, when it's getting food on the table, keeping a roof over your head, then that luxury item, which is Bitcoin, which you try and buy with your stack sats with your disposable income when times are good. Um, yeah, I think I think there's going to be a lot of pain, uh, unfortunately, and that might be the biggest educator. Uh, in a sad way, but uh, it's hard not to see. I, I totally agree with what Pete's saying from a financial standpoint. And then the flip side of that is, you know, that's a bullish case for Bitcoin. And then what's the bearish case for the other system, so to speak? Um, so w- what I've sort of noticed in all my kind of attempted orange pilling as shit as I am at it is that they're, you know, it is getting to a stage now where people, they're not, they're, it's the so far down their list, even like say 12 months ago, like there's like, Oh yeah. Blah, blah. But now it's just like, they can't fuck, they can't afford lettuce or they can't, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. So it, it's a, it's, it's such a hard orange pill sort of environment at the moment anyway. So does, does it have to happen? Does, does shit have to go sour before people? So I actually think there's a path where that person that you're talking about ends up at Bitcoin. And what happens is that person gets really frustrated at this list of things that gets bigger and bigger that they've got to pay or can't pay or are overdue on paying or whatever it is, right? All these expenses are building up. Things are getting harder and harder. So that person starts going, why is this list getting bigger and bigger? And then they start saying, well, what the fuck's actually, why, like, I haven't done anything wrong. I'm still working really hard. Why is that list growing? Why is everything getting harder to afford? And then people start looking at inflation and probably start looking at the premise of inflation. So between last bull run and this bull run, the word inflation wasn't really in the average Joe's head as much as it was today. And come the next bull run, I think I saw a stat on Twitter the other day that said by the next bull run, Bitcoin will be the... Uh, the most, the lowest inflation rate currency of choice out of any currency on the planet at the moment. Mm. So when you collide those two thoughts where people's thoughts are going to get aggressive and really accelerating as they're going through hard times, trying to figure out why is this time getting harder and harder? I haven't lost my job. I'm still working 40 hours a week. I'm still doing all the same things, but everything's getting more difficult. That person starts Googling inflation and then they start looking like, well, what's the thing? And I think there can be an organic understanding there. I don't know. What do you reckon, Pete? That feels uh, like a possibility, though. Yeah, I, I think absolutely it is. And people really don't question all of these things until the pain gets, you know, yeah. tough enough to, that they actually have to confront it. You know, we are resistant to change as humans are, that we don't want to change. And so until change is forced upon you, no one really wants to deal with it. One thing that I think is difficult in this environment, and this is where, you know, if you're looking to talk about orange pilling people and the rest of it, there are huge um, incursions on household budgets right now. So talking about orange pilling people with household cash flow is a next to a non-starter. It's a non sequitur. No one really has free cash flow to do that because of all the things that both of you just outlined. However, if, you know, they're serious about addressing the problem that, you know, whether they can actually articulate the problem or they just can feel it um, is another thing. But if they're willing to do a little bit of work and put in some effort, then to me, the ideal outcome for solving their problem, although it doesn't solve it immediate, but it does give them long-term hope, is the ability to buy Bitcoin in a self-managed super fund. 
And that's the only structure that we've got to do that. Now, that has a number of benefits. Firstly, it gets them some Bitcoin when they otherwise wouldn't have it. And it's a non-household expense, which means they don't have to come out. You know, they don't have to sacrifice anything in the day to day to actually get some of this. Now, the problem is, is that they might have to wait 20 years to access their superannuation or something yeah. like that. But at least they've got some <clears throat> form of hope of escaping this sort of terminal velocity or, you know, this this terminal decline in our economic system. So for me, you know, there's multiple conversations that you can have. And, and you know, for all of us, I think Bitcoin represents hope in some capacity. And for the people who aren't in this rabbit hole, I, you know, I, I genuinely wonder what life would be like if I didn't have Bitcoin and I was staring at these problems without the escape hatch, which is oh, Bitcoin. Yeah. You know, I'd be genuinely seriously depressed because, you know, I've worked hard. I've gone to university. I've studied. I've done everything they told me to do, and I was promised, you know, a quality of life that I'd be able to basically uh, support my wife, pay for my kids, and have a nice home. And guess what? I can't afford any of that. Mm -hmm. And so the realisation of having done everything, you know, correctly and being, you know, the good one, and then all of a sudden, hang on a sec, this dream I was promised isn't coming to fruition, but I've done everything society's asked of me. Even... That's even the thought of that is awful, right? For you. Correct. And, it's thought, a and, and for me. So the can you imagine what that is like in practice for people right now? Mm. I mean, Correct. I don't know if I don't know if any of those people are listening to this. I hope somebody is because mm. and they can get some value out of it, but I, I don't know. I genuinely don't know if it's just us talking to other Bitcoiners who, oh yeah, we, we all agree with that. Um, but that thought for somebody just now, and it's like, well, how how do we help those people? Let me ask a practical question then, Peter. Um and I just don't know. I just don't know the answer. So, in the self, if somebody was to put Bitcoin into self-managed super, is there any way to leverage any benefit out of that in the short term, or is that purely for retirement? Is there? What? It's purely for retirement. That's all it is. But this is where you know, I, I think a genuine thought, and this is where a shout out to the boys at uh, Amber. I think do a phenomenal job. I I put that Amber app as my gateway drug to Bitcoin because it allows you to buy a dollar a day like and you know even if you're on the bread line a dollar a day you can probably sacrifice something somewhere to get that dollar and then get the education of seeing this thing accrue in value which then sparks the thought for hang on a sec what else can i basically you know sell or sacrifice in order to buy more of this on a day-to-day -day basis and then you know this is something you know mike and i've had drilled into our heads since we were born what's the first lesson in finance bro then lesson you earn bingo yeah <laughs> and then that's the magic that's where all the magic comes from and it doesn't matter if you're earning a hundred dollars a week or a thousand or a million dollars a week spend less than you earn is critical because then you have the ability or uh, to, to invest a small portion and this is where with bitcoin because it's so divisible you have the opportunity to spend or invest a dollar a day in it and then all of a sudden, that leads the spark. That's the ignition that basically gets the mind whirring of what are the possibilities if I can increase my income, increase my savings, increase my investment. All of a sudden, there's your path out. There's your path to freedom. And so there's an immediate one with a 20-year payoff with your superannuation. And there's an immediate one with a dollar cost averaging of up to, say, a dollar a day or whatever the minimum is to actually spark that interest and see what the, the opportunity there is. So who instilled that? Is that is that from your dad? Yeah. 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 Around the dinner table? Or was it just, <laughs> all right, boys, we're going to go fishing? And No, no, dinner, dinner was always the chat. Dinner was always the chat. It was always yeah. like he'd come home, whether it was a good day or a bad day, and he'd just talk talk shop about his day, like, oh, yeah. man, this is fucked or blah, 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 <laughs> or this has been awesome. And so you're just sitting there, you're like a kid, and so you're just <laughs> eating dinner or not eating dinner or whatever and just listening. It's like a, you're like a sponge. Yeah. really are. Yeah. So it's earn, earn, basically spend less than you earn or earn more yeah. than you spend. Pick one. but And this is where it's a lot easier to spend less than you earn than Way easier. Earn, earn more. Yeah. yeah. So this one's for you. I suppose more, Michael, then. Um, if, if, um, sorry, pull my face in the wrong way. No, no just pull it up a bit. Well, then, pull You're up. just leaning on it like a fucking. Well, I'm trying to make way for the dog, man. The dog yeah. is yeah. taking up so Don't much wake room him on the up. sofa. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> um, the, uh, where was I going? Yeah, so let's shout out the guys at Amber. But they so they've made their service available mobile, right? It's mobile first. Um, yeah, yeah. so 
how important is that in this day and age in terms of the devices people are using and the types of people using different devices? Wait, it's, it's the hook. Yeah. Is that one of you? It's the hook. No, I added another one. That was a shit question. <laughs> no, go, go, go. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the three genie wishes it's like don't fuck that up <laughs> I wish yeah, for well, another three wishes dude, it's, it's extremely important it's extremely important I'll tell you why before anything right phones are your two factor for everything so if, you're per- if your friend doesn't have a smartphone it's it's or any kind of phone like you've got to remember like with smartphones comes security and like so that's the gateway to everything because you need security and you've got to instill security. So yeah, I think it's really important for any, I think it's just extremely important. If you're on a, if you're on a phone, if you're not on a phone, you're basically invisible now. Like, yeah. Yeah. It, and that, it really feels like that. And that's across all age groups now, right? Basically. Oh, 100%, it maybe I'm very small at the very top, but hopefully they'll be being helped by family or whatever. Yeah. Um, But all the kids, I mean, the kids are native device users yeah, yeah. native device users it's funny actually because kids now there's like kids i met some parents and their kid that the kids at school and they've all got bitcoin wallets because you just bitcoin wallets are downloading an app you don't need to go to westpac and give your forms and get your parents to co-sign anything yeah, so yeah, like that's right, a course. thing they have lightning wallets and they send like they sell bitcoin lightning or something like in the schoolyard for like really? five Is bucks that- three bucks yeah true story Fuck yeah, that's, that's cool. Good. Yeah, <laughs> how good. No that? age, no age limits for a Bitcoin wallet. It's oh, like, it, banks. It, yeah. And and when I went to uh, when I was in uh, San Francisco, I was in this incubator for you know digital currency like focus basically. It was called Boost VC, and there was a guy there that was a founder, and he was like fifteen from France, <laughs> and I think he was from France, and he was he'd never had a bank account before, so he was one of those people that just crossed the chasm at the time. Where he's like, I don't have a bank account why the fuck would I get a bank account? Like, it's kind of like saying, hey, here's your Gmail account. Oh, can you go down to the post office and mail something for me? He's like, where the fuck would I mail you a letter? Like, I've just, we, we, we passed that, aren't we? Where's so the value it's price? really interesting. It's really interesting when you see things like that. Like, it's because it's just a total change of consciousness. That person's like, what are you talking about? It's sort of like if someone told me to send a fax, I'd be like, "Yeah, why the fuck would I send yeah. a fax? What was it? Was it Ford that said... Uh... You know, if you'd asked people what they wanted, they'd have told you they wanted a faster horse. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> there you go. Exactly. But, you know, then you give the young ones a car and they don't, they never buy a horse, right? Yeah. Um, it's, um, all right. So, okay. Then go liquidity, right? So all I'm seeing now is little use cases popping up all over the place. Right, and what I mean is, like, maybe it might be the Fountain app, or maybe it might be Nostar, or maybe Web- it might Web-like be or... Weblake or Zapstream, or like, and that is a black hole for sucking in Sats. Yeah, right, an absolute yep. black. I mean, Michael but Sailor is the biggest black hole for sucking in Sats, but <laughs> beyond that, the actual small case is going to be bigger than Michael. You know, accumulating all the small cases is going to be bigger than Michael Saylor. What does that do to liquidity? And what does that do to like supply on exchanges and stuff? I mean, we're, I think we're seeing it's coming off exchanges now already, but um, what happens then? Hey, I think it's going to be glorious. And there's <laughs> no Bitcoin left on exchange. You know, everyone's sort of, mixed feelings about all these ETFs potentially being approved in a minute. I look at that and think, you know, these guys are the ultimate competitors in the finance world. They don't want to have the second best or the second biggest fund. They want to have the biggest. And so, you know, BlackRock's going to do their very best to get more than 650,000 coins in their ETF and there's 1.8 million Bitcoin left on exchange. After that, we can can mark that down to 1.15. Hope the maths works out on that. Someone check. Mm. Um, and then we've got Fidelity lined up behind them. We've got Vanguard. We've got um, a whole host of institutions and hedge funds and everyone else who wants an ETF and wants a slice of that pie too. And you've got to think, well, you know, in the next two to three years, we could go on a major bull run because at the same time that we've got all of this demand coming in, we've got just this massive sucking sound of coins coming off exchange going into these long-term hodling vehicles that, you know, in addition to, you know, the zaps and the and, and the rest of it and the microtransactions, You've got, you know, basically all of a sudden, to me, BlackRock and Larry Fink approved, well, 
you know, trying to get an ETF approved, basically is an implicit or explicit endorsement for the investing community to basically go hell for leather at it. So knock your socks off. All of a sudden, there's no career risk in investing in Bitcoin now for all of these investment advisors. Do you see any scenario where these um, ETFs are just not approved? Or do you think it's inevitable? I think it's inevitable. I think they're going to basically stall for the next six months, maybe eight, nine months. And my expectation is that come halving, there's going to be an approval of an ETF. You know, they'll be basically be able to stall for maybe six to nine months on that. And then, yeah, I expect fireworks when they... Well, actually, I don't expect fireworks when the ETF is launched because it's going to take time for the distribution networks to build out and actually sell this mm. to investment advisors because they've sold the message that Bitcoin's, you know, rat poison squared and it's for yeah. criminals and all the rest of it. And now finally they're changing their tune and going cap in hand to the same people they told was shit for the last 10 years that, oh, we've just done this. This is amazing. You want to put your clients in. It's like the advisor's like, hang on a second, you've told me it was shit for so long. Why am I doing this now? Like, And then, yeah. you know, the the bad thing for the advisor in the middle of it is they've got their client in their ear saying, I want some Bitcoin, I want some Bitcoin. Yeah. They've got their licensee saying, you're not allowed it, you're not allowed it. And then BlackRock's basically come and solve that puzzle. And, yeah, I'm looking forward to, to seeing that integrate into the advice network and, you know, investment advisors globally being able to basically advise on Bitcoin risk-free and with no career risk. So... That's going to pour a lot of money into it. Oh, sorry, uh, uh, Brendo, dumb question. Why, why would they stall? <laughs> like, what's their what's the motivation for them to stall? They can't control it. They don't understand it. There's a host of reasons. Like, probably a list as long as my arm is why they they would want to stall it. You know, they want to basically get themselves set up in the best possible decision to take advantage of it. Yep. They want to get their distribution network lined up so that they can benefit from it. The second it opens, they can fill it and basically suck all the air out of the rest of the market. <clears throat> from the US dollar perspective and the US government's perspective, they probably want to have probably two or three, realistically two or three key players who control the majority of Bitcoin so that they've got two or three people to answer to that if they need to manipulate things or push things around, there's only two calls to make rather than having, you know, at the moment, there's no one to call in Bitcoin. You've got Grayscale and you've got Coinbase, basically. There's two people, two entities to call. Mm -hmm. And they don't really want to call more than two people if they want to, you know, do something to the Bitcoin network. So I think they're basically trying to get their ducks in a row. There's multiple reasons in addition to that that they, you know, could be stalling. And then, you know, at some point in time, there's public pressure where, you know, we're seeing, you know, the banks here with Operation Choke Point 2.0 basically stall a whole host of, you know, transfers from clients' accounts to exchanges. Like we've had multiple calls this week alone. It's Thursday. I would have had three or four clients call me about the fact that they can't move more than $10,000 a month mm. to, you know, their their brokerage account to buy Bitcoin. Now, mm -hmm. that that's kind of distressing because, you know, these clients are trying to buy um, hundreds of thousands of dollars of Bitcoin and they're having to set up alternative banking arrangements in order to get the, you know, to get filled on what they want to invest in. Mm. And, you know, as, as much as I'm a proponent of fuck the banks, well, we still kind of need them to facilitate the migration to the Bitcoin network. And so if they turn the tap off, then, you know, we have a major problem in actually achieving the long-term outcome that we all want. Yeah. Yeah, you can't have narrow fire exits, basically. <clears throat> yeah, it's a great idea. Well done. Um, well, someone will get out, maybe. Well, here's the thing, right? If If they think... If Larry, if Larry thinks, um, that ETFs, what is Larry, Larry? What is Larry? What do you what think? Larry, what does Larry think? Yeah. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> um, so if Larry thinks that his ETF is getting approved, right, and Larry will think that. <laughs> Sorry, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna milk, milk this as much as I can. Um, the uh, Larry's got Larry's gonna front run Larry. Larry, I think, has front run Larry. I do yeah. think he's already filled his boots personally. I know. Yeah, I no doubt. But well, Michael front run Michael. Oh, probably a, a sailor. I'm sure you yeah. did yourself, Michael. But but um, <laughs> but um, but there's going there's going to be an inner circle there of people that are knowing what's coming, and they're going to they're going to want to front run the whole thing, right? So here's the here's the question. Is it a good, an actual? No, question? probably not. We'll okay. go. On. We'll have to find another question. Right. But um, 
that being the case, you, you started by saying, I think there's a two or three years worth of bull run or something coming, right? My question is, why is it only that? I, I can't see a situation where, because what's happening now is ways to spend your Bitcoin are popping up everywhere, right? So more and more of the Bitcoiners are going to go, well, oh, hang on a second. I don't have to sell this Bitcoin to make my life better. I just have to spend some of my Bitcoin on a gift card and spend that at Woolworths or whatever it might be, right? So they're because they'll do better from a capital gains perspective. Um, mm -hmm. you know, they don't they don't have it, they don't trigger an event. Um, and they they'll probably be thinking, well, if I'm or if I'm spending it to, you know, your maybe it's your local farmer, maybe it's um um, you know, something like that, your local farmer, you know, if you yeah. know he's a Bitcoiner and a hodler, if you're spending into another hodler, that's just another hodler, the Bitcoin isn't coming back on market at all no. right so if larry thinks that larry's front you know sorry i'll leave it but um if he's front running larry's mates are front running bitcoin's draining off exchange and the bitcoiner starts selling to uh, spend excuse me with other bitcoiners yeah why does the bull run ever stop it really doesn't that's the you know for our forever laura that yeah. literally <laughs> does go up there are peaks and troughs to that yeah, yes of course where, this is where I think Wicked Smart with his, you know, um, the parabolic that goes and then starts yes. flattening out and then yeah. starts curving up, I think absolutely is going to be indicative. I don't know what time period that's going to take, but I think that absolutely is going to turn out to be what happens. Yeah, because there's a point of, well, there is a point of no return, right? Like there's a point where, because one of the biggest motivators to come into Bitcoin usually for the first person is profit, basically. It's like, a, I can make more money. Now, if you get into a system, because remember, one system's decaying, like it's getting less and less, like if its confidence is its radius, it's shrinking, right? It's getting mm -hmm. smaller and smaller and smaller, like the confidence in the fiat system. So as you become a, you, know, you start buying Bitcoin you, to try and make money, if that's the first motivation, that's why we see these retraces after, you know, big bull runs, people taking profit, everything sort of the market swelling out. Um, but in the future, taking profit will be a dangerous exercise because you can't take it to anywhere. Profit will be a dangerous thing to take because it's almost like people are going to be quite, profit will be a risk on behavior. Taking profit will be seen as a risk on behavior because the profit that you're measuring in is wrong already. So yeah. it's deemed risky if your pro if your unit of account is in a you know a manufactured system that you don't have controls of the levers or you don't have access to view the levers even. Um, I can't imagine that behavior being expedited. And I think as people get really clever, um, the behavior should be more like what we see in you know probably third world countries, which has more in than out, and it's a less the motivation to get in there is much less of a profit making exercise and more of a function exercise. Because if you think if you're in Argentina, right? or whatever it is, like put one of those countries. If I'm in Argentina and someone says, yo, uh, US dollars or, you know, our currency is really unstable. And it's like, all right, cool. Well, let's go to US dollars. And it's like, all right, sweet. We go to US dollars and that's the black market currency or whatever. But now people are like, if you save in Bitcoin and you're not getting inflated, if you're getting inflated 90% a year and you're saving in Bitcoin, that volatility of 30% is free. It's literally free. You don't need yeah. to be sold on it. You've got yeah. the pain point. You're born into an environment that breeds this pain point. Yes. But that's you the were hard born market. That. Those guys, that market, that market behavior evolves. It, get, it catches up. It's coming to the West, which is inflation, which is where people go, I can't save in that. It's too expensive to use that currency. I, sure, I want to. It's easier to stay on the same currency. I can't be bothered switching and learning about this new thing. But I also can't be bothered working 600 hours a week just to buy bread or whatever it is. Um yeah, it's kind of weird, but yeah, I think I think that's going to happen. But I think the pain point, you know, people in the West or, you know, developed countries, we sort of look at it like, oh, cool, we can make money from this and, oh, faster, cheaper payments or something. And so that's a pretty kind of uh, cosmetic or, you know, a paper thin, it's a cheap win almost. Mm -hmm. um, it's, but to the real pain point, which is the larger population of the planet, they're coming in with, they're not going back. They don't need to go back. They've seen enough. They have never seen, you know, beautiful Westfield shopping centers with everyone walking around happily buying stuff on their credit card and all these things. They don't know that that world, like that world is not real to them. And mm -hmm. it's not really real to us because it's all built on debt anyway. We've yeah. just sort of, 
I don't know. Maybe that's a bit of a ramble, but it sort of feels like that's catching up to us. The common sense, common sense catches up basically. And I think that's sort of, you know, so breaking upwards instead of having these retrace, it is possible because there's going to be a point in time where there's general consensus. Like, you know, people find general consensus really quickly on the internet and they'll find it on inflation and it'll be the topic, the talking point, the topic, whatever. And there'll be a point where media has to make a decision on betting on the future or betting on the current system that they're entangled in. And so they'll have to start pushing a message because they're for-profit businesses. So if they're push- pushing a message that's not in line with the future customer base that's growing or whatever it is, they need to be answering to the future customer base as a media company, which means they may have to talk about things that they don't usually want to talk about because they're at a, you know, a point of no return. I don't know. Maybe. No, that That makes perfect sense. Yeah. That just to me seems like, um, like if you look at the red top, the tabloid papers in the UK, um, what they'll do often is they'll flip just before an election. If it's obvious where the election's going. Of course. Because as you say, they're playing to their readership and the readership are saying this. So that way they, they don't actually have a political opinion. They just, most of the time they, they don't unless, someone, unless there's like lots of payments or whatever sure, sure yeah. there is influence but yeah. at the end of the day like unless someone's paying their bills they're going to pay their own bills you know and that means you know yeah. figuring it out um which usually means retaining customers um so yeah. you know you know what's funny on that point bro about yeah. um you know basically the west doesn't really have the pain point that is in argentina venezuela you know choose your own adventure as to what yeah. country's got hyperinflation or about to have it. Yeah. You know, I, I look at this and think, yes, for the West, it's a superficial, it's a very superficial use case that we're looking at it from a, hey, let's come and get rich yeah, and and watch it go up, which I think, you know, has its mark. And this is where I look at, you know, psychology and think that is our most primary of drivers. So when I'm talking to yeah, people- Yeah, self-interest and greed, orange, basically. Greed and fear, literally. Yeah. The mm-hmm. two little reptilian- flickers it's either one or the other and you know at our most uh primordial level that is basically the motivator for getting into this whether we want to admit it or not you know we've yeah. been been here a while so i oh, know we're here for the revolution it's like piss off you came to get rich and you found something else so <laughs> yeah, um, <laughs> well if every person knew what it was before anything they <laughs> would have read the white paper once and jumped onto an exchange and straight into self custody. And you know, everyone's got their journey. It's an evolution of consciousness. It just takes time. It's fascinating. Yeah. It really is fascinating. So, so this is where, like, I like to quote. Um, I think uh, it was Zig Ziglar who talked about money, and he's got this southern draw when he says it. He says, "Money is not the most important thing on earth, but it is damn close to oxygen." Yeah. And I look at this and think, when the West figures out that you know what they have got in money isn't money and this is a more money than money that they're using then there's a flood of people to it and they realize all of a sudden this is where you know you look at the currencies that are hyperinflating bitcoin there is not a want it is a need Mm -hmm. it is a necessity Mm -hmm. and so people will pay overs for a necessity and this is why one dollar in you know Venezuela or Argentina, one US dollar is actually, you know, basically purchased for the equivalent of two US dollars because of that inflation and the fact that it retains value for a long period of time. And this is where when people figure out what Bitcoin is, they are going to YOLO into it as quick and as hard as they can when they realize that this is the most money, money available. So it's like Turkey is a recent example, I think, where Turkey's had an all time high in Bitcoin price. But obviously, Bitcoin's not at an all-time high anywhere else in the world. And so, like, that shows, like, this relevant localization of these currencies just breaking in half. So Bitcoin's kind of the yardstick where if Bitcoin's blowing up in your country and not anywhere else, it means that your country's currency is blowing up, not Bitcoin. Yeah, yeah. I think. Uh, yeah, you know, it seems to make that's sense. Ex- that's exactly yeah. what happens. Can you imagine, yeah. you know what's interesting to follow, and I, I like watching this, is the blow up between Safadine and Nassim Taleb. And what's interesting is both are Lebanese, both highly intellectual. One got to advise the Lebanese government on how to solve their inflationary problem and one was dissed and basically thrown out and they didn't listen to him. Now, you and I both know that Lebanon's going through a hyperinflationary event or close enough to it. Yeah. And can you imagine the disdain that Safadine has for, for Nassim? given that he was responsible for advising that government. 
And Safadine's not one to hold his tongue. Mm. I just look at that and I think, that's coming to a country near you soon. And the yeah. only way to protect yourself is to have Bitcoin. This is it. Like these, these are the canaries in the coal mine, right? And if people mm. could just pay attention to what's happening there, and there's some great Bitcoiners in those countries yeah. that you can just, like Effie, like you, he just tell you exactly what's happening, right? Mm. And you can go, wow, that's that, that's that. What that means is that's mm. happening for us in eighteen months or twenty four months or thirty six months, and you can just look at it and go, okay, position yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Um. We just imagine it's a huge benefit. You just mm. have to you just have to take advantage of the benefit you've just been lucky enough to be be fortunate enough to be given, right? Mm. Um. It's um. Yeah. It's it's going to be difficult. It's going to be difficult. Uh, Michael, talk. To, I know you're on a bit of a hard stop. So, um, yeah, the, yeah. I I fucked that up before when I said, yeah, oh, I think, you know, I think Pete's only got an hour, and, but that was you, Michael. <laughs> all good. No <laughs> dramas. Yeah, all good. Um, can you just talk to us as well? Because I'm talking. If I'm talking about use cases coming through for, yeah. you know, as I say, zapping or streaming or podcasts or yeah. whatever, is people spending and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. The, the microtransaction stuff that's really starting now. Mm -hmm. Talk to us about. What it what it means when AI enters that game, and the machines yep. the machines start draining liquidity. What's, well, they're going to have to. They they will have to. This is the thing that like the population isn't eight billion people. The population is eight billion plus. Call it twelve billion across devices, machines, and servers, and you know all that sort of stuff, right? Um, if they're all going to, they all they will all operate on one currency. They're not idiots. Machines are very like they're not intelligent, but they're intelligent. Like they copy us. They're all us. And if we're going to Bitcoin, they're going to Bitcoin. Like that's like everyone's gravitating towards Bitcoin. Machines will do the same. They'll have a faster path there because it's objectively the heaviest chain. So there's not going to be any discussion about it. They don't need to be orange pilled. They're like, yeah, yes, boss, next. And so that like that time to orange pill is like a nanosecond, but that's 12 billion people call it 1 billion devices or machines. Now, um, you know, a machine's going to be talking to each other. Like, you know, is my toaster talking to my washing machine? No, but is someone's server talking to someone else's server that have some working relationship that they just keep going back and forth? You know, I don't, I don't know what it would look like, but, I know machines will want to get paid and I know people will want their machines to keep running and people will want Bitcoin for it. Yeah. I don't get, I, I just don't get that. Like why, why does a, a non-sentient being want to be paid? Well, what, wh who's and controlling well, and the and non, yeah, yeah. So who's controlling the because, because you're implying that they're accumulating and holding and storing wealth. So why? Well, it's not working for its, it's working for the owner of the machine. That's why, yeah. So someone has to program that machine. So let's oh, yeah, take, yeah, okay, yeah. So let's take ChatGPT, right? And and what yeah, will yeah. happen is owners will program their machines to get paid different ways. But let's look at like the best. The best thing is a lot of the dark markets, right? So the ransomware, ransomware aren't asking for you know USDC. Mm. They're not asking for Binance Coin. They're not. They ask for Bitcoin, and that's it. It's not like because it's the one thing everyone agrees on you know dark white like you know dark hat white hat whatever you are everyone goes this is just it like this is it so all the people that are going to be like chat gbt for example people have built these automated chat gbts where you can run at a task like run a task and it sits there on your computer running just like a node does right your node's running all the time this chat gbt thing can be performing tasks for you all the time now at the moment they're all talking to the internet and you know, just in a feedback loop. But once they all start talking to each other, because my sentient chat GBT that does one task for me every day, whatever that is, it might be the best at that task. So I start renting out its performance of doing that task because I've got the perfect prompt or whatever it is. Now I'm sort of renting that prompt's performance to someone else. Um, and because I can't, I'm not going to give them my OSCO bank Westpac details to pay for that service. I'm going to say, okay, well, the easiest one, the most common APIs, the most liquidity, the most, 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 most is Bitcoin. Um, people will try and tinker with it and they'll try and find reasons why not. But at the end of the day, it's just, it's too much of, it provides too much certainty in an uncertain environment, which is machines, which is, you know, lots of stuff happening all the time. Uh, Bitcoin's quite a good constant. Plus machines all... Uh, 
all respect Bitcoin as a chain. So every machine would have a lot of data on Bitcoin and its performance. So if, if we just told the machine to search the internet, right, we didn't have to any input and we told it to get a wallet, the machine would likely assume this thing hasn't changed in the longest amount of time. So that gives me certainty because remember, I'm a machine. I need certainty. I don't like, you know, hand wavy shit. I need very specific information. So I just think there's a really big sleeping thought there. It might not eventuate, but it's something to consider whether you're building products, whether you're marketing, whatever you're doing, yeah. it's yeah, there's yeah. something there. I'm not totally sure what it is, but there's something there. Gotcha. I was just imagining some AI bot going, getting greedy and going, hmm, I'm going to take all of the Bitcoin and go back to my digital hole and just. It sit. could. It might. Yeah. We never know. Someone, you know what? Someone could write a bot that does something really well that then drains all the other bots or it makes it like, you know, they write some sexy thing, some sexy algorithm that the bots all think they want, but it's fooled the bots just like it's fooled a human. And then it's drained everyone's coins. It's going to be so many, it's wow. just a totally different world. It's like living with a new species, I think, mm -hmm. where there's going to be behavioral changes. There's got to be a lot of, you know, empathy and understanding for how their behavior, because their behavior mm -hmm. will affect us. If, if a machine has limited processing power, and it starts getting a lot of intelligence in its own where we depend on it a lot. Use your algorithm to make the best next decision or whatever it is. And it starts thinking, well, I don't need many inputs because I'm doing it all myself. And then you kind of get in this weird place where it's like if it's not cryptographically secured, meaning like a key is holding it back from being whatever it wants to be, Um then, yeah, you could get some really interesting use cases where it sort of runs along on its own thoughts and you could see how it wanders around the internet. But, um, but yeah, every machine is going to, every machine's preference will come from a human. And right now, the biggest preference for humans, good or bad, is Bitcoin. Um, and so I think they'll inherit those preferences as well. Cool. I think. But that's, that then is just, so you, uh, I'm thinking of somebody listening going, holy shit. If a bot becomes cleverer than me, which it will be immediately, mm -hmm. I have to then I, I then have to be so clever with how I'm managing my Bitcoin, which is just even more reason mm. to have your Bitcoin in cold storage. Yes. Um and just have whatever is available in say a lightning wallet that you require as a as a think of it as a checking account. Yep. Mm -hmm. it, it really is like that. A hundred percent agree. Like it's you know, be like Smaug from Lord of the Rings or whatever, the Hobbit, the mm -hmm. the dragon. He's like like over his coins, <laughs> crawling around in his cave. That's basically where you are. And you take a little tiny bit out that is at risk at any time, much mm -hmm. like a wallet in your pocket. Mm -hmm. um, but I think I think the difference between – see, this is an old conversation, right? People have said, you know, your wallet will be like you're checking and you'll have cold storage. But people are realising now that checking accounts in general are very like fiat, in a way. They're very, oh, it's good because I can spend everything on everything. You know, it's kind of like this spend zone account. And I think the mentality, once you start acquiring Bitcoin, you lose this desire to spend on anything but Bitcoin. Like it's quite hypnotizing almost like you're an idiot where you're like, oh, no, I don't need to eat tonight. I'll just buy some more sats. It's like, what? You know, you see those jokes, the memes where it's like, oh, I've been stacking so hard and it just shows this dude with a mattress in the middle of his room and nothing else. <laughs> it's it's kind of like that where that sort of... Uh, it, you know, that feels very real to me that people are going to get over stuff, like just get over all the bullshit. Um, Consumerism. How, how we all yeah. become young and fit again is no one eats. Well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they tell you that. <laughs> but there, there, there are things, right? There are things that okay. I know there's the, you know, none of us should own a chair and all this stuff. And I get it. But yeah. I lock my chair. Yeah, yeah. No, we're sitting on one. So we're all sitting on yeah. one, right? Yeah. So there does come a point where you go, okay, well, I, to make my life better, you know, I would quite like to sit at a table or something, right? You know, I need to drive from yes. here to there. So I want yeah. a car. I'd like to sit. Yeah. In a... But it just to me, it seems like you only bring out the Bitcoin, not to just have it sitting somewhere. You bring it out to spend it on the thing that you want. Yes. Very intentional. Yes. It's very intentional. A completely mindful purchase. Yeah. 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 Yes. That's exactly yeah. what it is. Except yes. that's what I, I sent for the fucking Airbnb. <laughs> god damn it but like i'm sort of thinking that when you were talking about the AI thing, I was, I was almost thinking like that i was thinking about the airbnb like that is sort of the model it's like you have a thing which happens to be a house you're renting it out 
but the house is kind of making the money for you. It's sort of like the analog version. It's sort of the hybrid version of where we're going to with the digital version. I, I think the the easiest way to think about how AI, AI will require a payment system and a you know basically create revenue is autonomous driving. You know, basically mm-hmm. taxis. You buy an, you buy a Tesla. You pay for auto autopilot. You send it out into the world. You basically receive sats. It needs you know ongoing conditioning and checkups and things like that. So yeah, pulls into or drives itself to a service station. They do whatever work is needed to do. The car's got the sensors to know that it's done. They pass the sats to you know whoever does the work, and then they carry on trying to accumulate as much Bitcoin as they can. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, because I think the model, the model just now is that um, the Uber model is like 73 percent driver, twenty seven percent Uber. Mm-hmm. So you take a ten dollar fare or whatever it is, and you know that's you know seven dollars thirty, two dollars seventy. But the incentive for Uber clearly is to lose the driver. Yeah, right? there's a big fat margin waiting for it. Massive. If they can do it. Massive. That's why they're public. That's why people are investing in them. They're waiting for that moment. I think. Yeah. And once they, but even I even think beyond that, what, what, they won't even then go. Oh, I know what we're going to do. We're going to buy a hundred thousand Teslas. No, you'll buy a Tesla, and they'll mm. rent it from you. And instead yeah. of seventy three percent, they'll pay four. Yeah. And but you're quite happy because eighty percent of the time, or ninety five percent of the time, your car does nothing but sit in your driveway or sit outside your office. Yeah. So when you come climb back into your car at the end of the day, the car's made eighteen dollars twenty or five five thousand sats or fifty thousand, yeah. whatever it is. And you got to spend twenty dollars cleaning up the spew. Yeah, but you won't back. because the car will have noticed that that's what's happened. It'll have taken it to a service. The ser- it'll be cleaned. It'll come back to you in pristine condition, full of fuel. Yeah, and you'll just climb in and go home. Yeah. And I- it's like it's the same thing as like Airbnb in your house when you're on holiday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right. Airbnb. Uh, what is it? Uber shares, you say? Hmm. Oh, yeah. Uber, <laughs> Uber share is a thing. That's where you basically drop your car anywhere and you just say, rent. Uber share is that. It's, I've got a car. It's not being used. Someone can use it. And you yeah. basically list it on Uber share and they can walk around. They've got an app and it says, oh, shit, there's a car 40 meters from you. Oh, it's a, your Toyota Corolla. Sweet. There's two of us. Let's go. And you go wow. and, you know, digital unlock and stuff. Yeah. Wow. Well, my sister, so this is personal, but my sister actually does that. So they were buying a new car. Um, yeah. They took the old car to the dealer. Um, the dealer offered them a crap value. So what they decided to, at the back in the back then, it was, I think it was maybe called something like Car Next Door or something yeah. like that. Yeah. Um, they put it on Car Next Door. They have a key lock outside their house. They have an yep. app that shows yep. exactly when the car is available. So they still have the car available to them as a second car. If they mm. need, to yep. need it, they don't need it mostly. So... Um, it just sits and they see where the car is. That car has now made more than the dealer offered them on the trade-in value, and they still own the car. Now, wow. granted, the car's getting older, and yes. you know it probably needs a bit more work. Appreciation, sure. Yes, but, yeah. but there's but it doesn't matter because it's already cleared more money. That's awesome. Yeah. So yeah. that's um, cool. Yeah, but I think that is what was then bought out by Uber. I th- if you're, is that what you're talking about, Michael? Is that maybe the same thing? Uh, maybe they turned it into Uber Share. Yeah, yeah. but it was yeah. the same premise basically. Yeah. Where... Exactly that, right? Yeah, and I'm just like, well. Why would everybody not do that? And I actually think this is actually what I think is going to solve. Not so well, yeah. I, I don't think building roads and bridges and tunnels and stuff like that—that's not going to solve congestion. Like that's a, that's a really slow thing to do. And then the time it takes to build and expensive. And then the time it takes to build the tunnel, you know, the traffic increases fourfold or something, yeah. right? So mm. actually, what it's going to be is that ninety-five percent of the the time that the vehicle you've currently got doesn't do anything, it will all of a sudden do something. And then we need, you know, eighty percent, sixty percent, forty percent less cars on the road. Yeah, and they're all going in the same direction. No one's yeah. changing lanes incorrectly. Yeah. No one's going oh backwards on the wrong. Street. It's it's hype. It's maximum efficiency, basically. Yeah. Yeah. No shit drivers. Yeah, no shit, no shit drivers. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, yeah, mate. I'm conscious of your time. Yeah. Um, are you? We good? Is there anything you yep, want to? I'm I'm good to bounce, guys. I'll leave you guys for an intelligent conversation now. Thank you, for sharing, those uh, nude, uh, better, thank you for sharing those nude pictures of Peter. We'll share them on the. On the- <laughs> you know, you know, he's only going to play Street Fighter. That's all he's doing. <laughs> True story. Look, I must be the worst able-bodied player online at the moment. No joke. Easily, yeah. like I, I, I surprise myself with just how bad my skills are. So L- losing to a seven-year-old. Yeah. Oh, dude, I wish four year old <laughs> people that haven't played before. Like, <laughs> and I'm trying, I'm trying hard. Like, it's so good being shit, though. Anyway, <laughs> all good. I'm used to it.
Uh, guys, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much for having me, bro. Love you. Speak to you later. Love Bye, you, guys. Bro. Have a good night. See you, Michael. Mate. Thank you, See mate. You. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Cheers. That was awesome, guys. What a yeah. treat. Oh, I'm so, I love I'm him. so sorry. <laughs> no, I love it. I'm like, well, what do you need me for? You got the real yeah. deal. <laughs> it's um, funny. I, I often think of myself as the explain it like I'm five version of Michael's thoughts. Like, because uh, I've had so much time to sit there and listen and filter them. It's like, oh, okay, I've got this really massive concept that he's come up with and can filter it down to... Oh, you're a, like you're a an mic. amazing match. It's a, to be honest. It's a foil. Like, it's like a... <clears throat> we'll keep, it's a on. partnership, man. It's, it's absolutely... It's a great... Like, so fortunate to have each other. It's cool. It's really cool to look at and watch yeah. and just yeah. see the different... Like, the different skills, but they play off each other so well. It's really good. Yeah. Um, no, to be... Like, to be, sorry, before you go on. No. Like, like I, I need people like you, Pete, because... <laughs> As as amazing as Michael is, he's so out there. Like like I'm listening to some explanations, and I'm just going, this guy is on another level. Like like to keep up with him as well. It's just like yeah. fuck. And I'm yeah. Anyway, I need you. I've, I've got to say, one of the funniest things I've seen on Twitter was when he posted all of his uh, prime number thoughts and basically went through a deep thread on that. And someone underneath basically wrote, "Ah." Oh, explain it like I'm five. And so then Michael went through an iteration of explaining it like I'm five. And then the next comment that he made was explain it like I'm two. <laughs> <laughs> That's so good. Uh, I knew exactly where he was going. The second he said explain it like I'm five. And I, I took one, one read of Mike's line and I went, he's not going to, not going to cut it. <laughs> I mean, it's really awesome that he made the attempt to. Yeah. Right? yeah. yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay, this is my I'm busting for a piece and a smoke. Mate. All right, I'll start to be. Yeah. Um, oh, good. Mate, you've been a busy boy. Yeah. You want to talk to us really about busy. is that is that okay to talk about on this? Is that yeah, absolutely. So yeah. So, Whatever you guys want to talk about, no, I'm, I'm I'm here for. I mean, as I said at the beginning, you were kind of obviously you've been involved. Well, Michael's been involved in Bitcoin for a long time, and you've you know for quite a long time too, but then publicly it's 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 come very, it, you know, you, your star genuinely has continued to rise. <laughs> right. Very, but like just seriously though, like it's, a, it's awesome to see. And um, how is, how has that been? And like, are you enjoying that? Or like, it's just, it must be pretty full on. Uh, you know what? I, I, I don't really think about it from, from that perspective. But one thing I do love is, you know, I, I sincerely and genuinely love talking about Bitcoin and being able to talk to, you know, great Bitcoiners across the globe about it. I think, you know, what a what a wonderful existence that is. Like being able to talk Bitcoin, like, you know, mates of mine joke that, you know, I've only got two modes of conversation. One's golf and one's Bitcoin. Like, and they think your poor, long suffering wife having to deal with that shit <laughs> chat. <laughs> She should meet my wife. That would be that would be, they might get on. <laughs> it, it's it's funny. It's almost like we need like a an AA group for long suffering Bitcoin wives. Like yeah, I'm sure I'm sure there's long suffering Bitcoin husbands, but it is definitely more the way. <laughs> so they, yeah, um. So what kind of um, uh, like, is it work related particularly, or is it like what kind of insights are you getting from doing the pods as well, or like different perspectives from different from different people in different places. I, I think there's sort of a number of sort of really sort of broad themes that come out across everywhere um, on a number of levels. From, from a podcasting perspective, I think the Bitcoin community all is right. start. <laughs> the Bitcoin... Yeah. All right. Sorry. Got to go. Brenda's, sending a... Brenda's yeah. losing a child. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I think Bitcoiners at this point in time in the market uh, kind of feel like there is um how, how would I put it? There is a there is a lack of entropy. Uh, there's a lack of new thought, and this is where I think the Bitcoin community is starved for original content and original thought because it feels like we've, you know, for those who have been here for the last say three or four or five years, mm -hmm. you know, we've had such wonderful contributions from such mega brains, you know, and just you know, sort of a go to list that I look at and think, you know, what what phenomenal talent. That we've got in this space, you know, from the top, you know, Jeff Booth, Knut, um, Alex Gladstein, whether you like him, love him or hate him, Jason Lowry, mm -hmm. we've got great con contributors across the park. I love Luke Broyles and what he's bringing to the table with, you know, um, all of his sort of exponentials that that he's talking and thinking about and how uh, technology doesn't slow down, it speeds up. So we've got more 
more more in common in common with you know the age of Jesus than we do a hundred years into the future. And you know, these are all great thoughts, and you know, really gets yeah. the brain worrying about you know where we're going. But the the educational content, the amount of podcasts and education on this space is is so intense, and you know, all of those people have contributed enormously to the space in really sort of bringing all Bitcoiners to a higher consciousness when it comes to what is this thing and mm-hmm. an understanding level. And from a, you know, sort of doing a few different podcasts, um, I think a lot of people are, uh, are craving original content, original thoughts. Give us something to think about. And this is where, for me, what's fun, you know, for us is to think about that valuation framework. Like I look at that and think, yeah, hey, here's a framework that, um, you know, if you sort of peel the layers back on that, you know, why did I come up with that? Well, the real reason for coming up with that was so people would avoid basically putting money into altcoins because people really don't understand what's ahead of us when it comes to Bitcoin. And if people really understood that, hey, I have the ability to buy Bitcoin at the equivalent of 2009 prices today, they'd buy it. But they think, oh, well, Bitcoin, because of a unit bias, they think that, you know, oh, it's you know $30,000 a coin today, uh, all the upsides behind it. And they don't realize that, you know, this thing's going to be millions, if not what I think will really be billions of dollars, um, you know, in the relatively near future. Yeah, um, I agree with you in terms of, I've seen a little bit of criticism, um, not not specifically criticism, but it's like, it's what you're saying. It's like people are starved of original thought. This, they're smart people and, they, and they, they, they're looking for something else. And and like per- personally, like we are, we are putting out this thing um, but, and I feel that too. Like, I'm like, we need to be original for people or we are, or it's not, and there's no, there's no point in it. Right. Yep. But here's my challenge, right? You, you, firstly, you can't come up with some original thought every day. I personally, <laughs> I certainly can't. Right. But, but also like 99% of people aren't here yet. So there's 1% of smart people, right. Who have, who have worked out and they've listened to their thousand hours of podcasts. And frankly, I'm going to piss people off here, but those people need to fuck off and move on. <laughs> you know, go learn another topic because you have mass, you have mastered this. Yeah. Um, you, there's nothing else for you to do here. Um, you, you know, you, you got this, you've worked this one. Out. Yeah. They're, they're going to be new things, but go, the, you know, go be the Noster expert or go be the health guy or go be the farmer. Like go, whereas the, there's a chat, there's, 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 there needs to be a voice or lots of voices to speak to the, 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 you know, the, the, the herd that's coming in. Yeah. Um, and that's, I guess that just comes down to like individual capability. Like who, who are you able to talk to? Like Correct. there's nothing I can teach Matt Liddell about privacy. Mm-hmm. Right. I'm not even going to try. Yeah. Right. Um, that's, that's stupid even trying. So um, it's just, yeah, I think people need to, it's you know we can all criticize and stuff it's really easy but like people need to go okay well yeah I've, i have i think i've got this now yeah, and yeah. i'm probably just wasting time listening to podcasts or whatever it is yeah. um if you if, if you're not at that stage yet absolutely keep listening but... you keep listening till you get to that stage yeah and yeah. and this is where like on two points of that it's really critical for those you know masters of the universe when it comes to bitcoin like you know, the people I mentioned to keep delivering that message because when, you know, the state of or the number of Bitcoin is basically doubles every one to four years, basically 50% of the population in a four year period of Bitcoiners haven't heard that message. Mm-hmm. So it's critical for them to maintain that message and, and spread that word so that all the newbies to Bitcoin continue to hear that because I think, you know, these are, you know, fundamental values or drivers of Bitcoin that creates the value of the community. And this is where, you know, say something that Wiz talks about, which I think is critically important, just as important as the protocol, is the community and the values that the community espouses that they want to ascribe to what Bitcoin is. And so this is where, <clears throat> yes, take what you want from it and move on. But there are some critical messages that need to be reiterated, you know, time and time and time again, because until we've got full adoption, it's critical that those, you know, those messages and key messaging points actually get through to the new. So, um, and then on the other point, which is, you know, once you've had your feel and you feel like there's no, you know, new thought for you, find the new thing. You know mm-hmm. who who I messaged, and I go back and forward every now and again with um, who is a case in point when it comes to that, is Parabolic Trav. Remember him? Yeah. I loved Parabolic Trav in the last bull run or the two bull runs ago. He was the man. I just loved the charts, the bullishness, yeah. all the rest of it. 
And then he disappeared. And I messaged him and he's come up as Metatrav now. And he's basically redefined his whole life as basically uh, someone who's basically helping men with health and fitness and a community building uh, a tournament male, I think is his, you know, his new role. Yeah. And it's funny, like I messaged him and I said, hey, man, when's, you know, his parabolic trav, this is two years ago, or maybe a bit more. I said, hey, with the bear market over, is parabolic trav coming back? Can we, and he goes, mate, look, I've moved on for it. I'm just yeah, waiting, waiting for the day that the rest of the world figures it out. And I've got my Bitcoin. I don't need to do it any, you know, I don't need to be doing parabolic trav anymore. I'm, I'm good with, you know, his new geek. And I thought, yeah. what a great outlook on life. What, Definitely. you know, mm. humble, you know, hardworking, you know, he came for the fun you know, obviously got whatever he needed out of it. He still has his Bitcoin, but now he's finding other ways to contribute. And this is where, say, one of the conversations we've had previously is Bitcoin, I still believe, is the fastest way to scale that Maslow's needs hierarchy. And now mm. for, <clears throat> and I haven't had this conversation with Trav, but I'm just surmising in my head and, you know, assuming that his ultimate self-actualization is basically building a group of like-minded males around him to help better their lives so he is literally self-actualizing at the top of that pyramid with a group of blokes that he thinks are mates and you know that love being around that environment and he's basically trying to help men get better for their families and friends what where's a great he, life where's he based good question uh the okay. u.s somewhere maybe canada but i think it's u.s yeah but okay. meta meta trap and i'll send you his details if um if you want them but um like what a glorious contribution, like made a massive impact for me on, you know, in Bitcoin land. And then he's like, mate, I don't need to be doing that anymore. I'm, I've moved on. I'm doing other things that are more fulfilling to him. And this is where yep. I, I think in some way, shape or form, Bitcoin has helped him escalate that needs hierarchy. And now he's self-actualizing by doing stuff he actually wants rather than basically putting up parabolic charts of Bitcoin. Yeah. Well, this is kind of the, into the um, like, I don't mean him, him specifically. I just mean, um, okay, you're rich now. Now what? Bingo. Right. right? Yeah. And that's the, that's actually, it's actually quite hard. It's a really hard question. It's actually a lot harder than stacking sats, right? Yeah. Stacking, stacking sats is real easy. It's become real easy. So yeah. um, if you, but then going, oh God, I'm going to have all this time. That's what, I, that's what I've always wanted. Now what the <laughs> now hell, what? Now what the hell am I going to do right. with it? Right. right. Uh, uh, th this is, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the expression, the dog that caught the car. That is no, fundamentally no. what you've described. Yeah, right. Okay. No, the dog the dog chases after the car. The car stops. Yeah. It's like, well, hang on a sec. I don't actually want to bite the car. I just want to pretend yeah. I'm big and tough and just chase it. Chase. And bark yeah, and, yeah. yeah. And so when it stops, it's like the dog stops. It's like, shit, what do I do now? Yeah. So <laughs> when it yeah. comes to Bitcoin, this is where, you know, I think people think wealth or riches solve problems but i actually think it magnifies them and mm -hmm. if your house is not in order mm -hmm. then it allows excesses to get out of control far quicker far faster than they would if you weren't and this is where say um i think i'm exceptionally fortunate to you know have the family i do the brother i do like michael you know could do whatever he wants and you know he's so exceptionally humble and you know, focused on time and his health and everything else, you know, none of the wanky bullshit that, you know, you think you want when you're on that road to wanting riches really matters. It's it's such a frivolous, uh, frivolous pursuit when you break it down, when you actually get it. And then, you know, if you've got it, you're the dog that caught the car, you realise, oh, maybe the Lambo really isn't the thing I wanted and mm -hmm. it doesn't provide any happiness. And yeah. Um, sort of share a story with you. I, I don't know if I've shared this and I don't think I've shared this publicly, but it was, um, in hindsight, it was quite a shameful moment for me in that Michael uh, called me one day and said, uh, bro, I'm going to buy Lambo. And my immediate response was, what do you want to do that for? Firstly, you know, we're big dudes. We don't fit in Lambos. Like, <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, oh yeah. And I'm like, on top of that, you can look like a wanker, like really? <laughs> and he's like, oh, well, oh. And, you know, I got to sleep on that. And what I didn't realize was Michael spent 10 years chasing a dream. And I don't know anyone who worked harder for that 10-year period than he did. 
Like I'm talking, he worked 18 hour days. When I went to visit him in San Francisco, like we literally went out, I took um, he and his wife out for dinner. We had a lovely dinner. We came home at 11 o'clock. Uh, he sat down, I was in bed. He was sitting on the couch, just having a chat to me. And uh, I said, uh, I'm going to go to sleep. He's like, oh, okay, cool. Well, I'm, I'm just going to go to work. And I'm thinking, it's 11.30 on a Saturday. What are you doing? Anyway, I went to sleep. I had a six-hour sleep. Got up at like 5.30, 6 o'clock, and he's basically walking around again. I'm like, oh, hey, bro, you, what are you doing? He goes, oh, I've just got home from work. I'm like, okay, well, do you want to do something? He's like, yeah, great. And then we're off for the day. But the reason why I tell you that is Michael sacrificed an enormous amount, like so much sacrifice I can't tell you. I dismissed his dream and goal of having a Lambo. This was a dream he had from 2013 when it was all about when Moon Lambo and, you know, you made it in crypto when you bought your Lambo. And that was the benchmark that he wanted to pursue. I woke up the next morning feeling like a complete and utter asshole. Like here I am, big brother, pissing on his dream that he'd had for the last 10 years and he's worked harder than anyone else and like sacrificed so much. Anyway, I called him up. I'm like, bro, sorry to be a jerk. I think the Lambo is a great idea. Let's go grab one you know, take it for a test drive, go buy one, let's do it. And he's like, oh, no, you're right. I think it's wanky. I'm like, Ugh. <laughs> <laughs> felt bad. I was like, Ugh. anyway, um, but, but he's, that, he's but that's just it. It, right. Everybody's going to have a different dream. Correct. And this is where, you know, Bitcoin, I think, allows us to fulfill all of those dreams and, and more. And this is where, you know, say for Michael, you know, he could have bought the Lambo and done all that and, he just went, nah, that's, you know, that doesn't really fulfill the dream. And then it sort of brings in a whole host of other problems. And, you know, this is why I love him so much. You know, he's happy driving Nan's 15 or 16 year old Toyota Echo, which is basically the smallest, cheapest, shittest Toyota you can buy. He barely fits in it yeah. and he loves it because it works 24 yeah. seven whenever he wants yeah. it to. I'm like, yeah, that to me is the definition of success. He has, you know, everything that he wants and more and you know he wants for nothing yeah yeah it's a bit like my, my uncle sales right he's uh, eight, he's in his 80s he's sailed his entire life um and he gets a lot of criticism for people because he's always spending on his boat and you know buying another boat and all this and i'm like no the man likes to sail yeah right yeah. he has sailed he crossed the atlantic as crew oh. right so i um, mean so and he said he'd never do it again just out there. but um <laughs> but um but he's, he's spent his whole like if you if you actually use the boat, you should get a boat. Yeah. If you're just buying a boat to stick it at the end of your jetty at the end of your fancy house that you're also using to impress people, you, you know you wouldn't even know how to take it out. Don't have a boat. Mm. Yeah. It's just what is important to you, and it's this where mm. this is where I quite like seeing the stories of like Saddam, who's you know part of the golf thing, and like there's guys that have a shared interest. They love it. They're pulling their Bitcoin. They're wanting to buy a golf course, right? I, I, who knows? Like, who knows? Frankly, the, the, you could just do it yourself, right? Yeah. If you believe in the Bitcoin story, you could just do it yourself. But that's not what it's about. It's about the creating the community, being there with a bunch of guys, you know, seeing if we can, like the stories along the way, supporting each other's businesses, getting to know each other's families. Like, yeah. that's what it's actually about. Mm, yeah, um, yeah. The Bitcoin thing is just so secondary. Uh, it's yeah. just like the thing that may enable it, right? And um, what I find so ironic about that is that we all come to get rich, but we end up finding that it's the community that we find that is the real juice in this. Yeah. That's the best part. Like for me, you know, we talked about, you know, basically I've been busy and sort of very quiet up until, you know, recently um, sort of coming out, so to speak, as a Bitcoiner. Um, you know, one of the greatest experiences, you know, for me in the last 10 years was turning up to a bush bash. Literally, yeah. it was felt almost yeah. spiritual because, yeah. you know, here are all these like-minded people who I can have the most intriguing and deep conversations and a, a, a sincere, deep connection, having just met them. And all of a sudden, I can meet them on a level that is so much deeper than the superficial conversations we typically have on a day-to-day. -day. And for me, that was such a powerful moment, but that is the power of community. And it sort of, you know, detaches you from, you know, the whole get rich quick scheme to having that connection with community and showing you what's really important. So I, you know what I love about them as well, mate, you feel like you can disagree with somebody and still mm -hmm. go get them a beer at the bar. Yeah. Yep. 
or the other way around, right? Like, oh, I totally fundamentally don't think that's true. Mm. And then go, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Neither do I. I. I think you're totally wrong. Oh, okay, fair enough. Let's go up and well, drink. Well, hey, what do right. you think of that? That um, What is it? 88 sets? Is that the thing? Yeah, the, do- the, yeah, the, yeah. the golf idea of actually like, you know, people pooling together and, and eventually buying a golf course. Let it rain. That sounds great. That's awesome. Who doesn't want to own a golf course? Oh, my God. <laughs> I, I as a kid I actually wanted to design and, and have a, a crazy golf course. I got it, because I, got I because I reined in my my ambition. I suppose I originally probably did want to design and you know all this stuff. And then I went, no, that's probably unrealistic. So I then I thought, and then I went to Florida as a kid to Disney. And holy shit, they, I tell you what they do that the Americans do things well when they're not kind of, that kind of. And you go and you're like, wow, this thing is incredible. And uh, you have always wanted to, have, but yeah. Anyway, that's a, that's, <laughs> that's for another day. You but, might uh, need to get on um, get on the the show Holy Molly as like a uh, Molly. guest designer. Do you know Holy Moly got? I think Holy Moly got canned because somebody got badly injured. <laughs> yeah, I don't even How know. How did you that get is. badly injured? Pop, was, it, no, 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 it wasn't. It was like massive big win. Did you ever watch it? Never. Right, it was putt putt right, but it was like um, massive windmills that would smack you into a pond and like. Mm. <laughs> like was, oh, you you'd remember Pete? You remember great. you'd remember it's a knockout when we were kids. Awesome, the best. Yeah, it's great. The best show. Oh, you, what you had that? Yeah, that's, yeah. I thought that was Australian. Yeah, so we did gave, I. We gave you, you know, you know, what was, you know what was my favourite? There was the boats in the little pool that they'd make, and they'd have yes. like a pirate ship battle or yes. something. Yes, can't even remember that. But all I remember is little boats sailing across this little pool. Oh, so and good. It was epic. It's a knockout. That's the name, the name of the game. game. <laughs> boom, boom. Oh, I loved it. Um, uh, Mate, what do you want to do? A businessy stuff or not? Up to you. I'm happy. I'm happy chit chatting and cool. Um, about whatever you want. What? Um, how much can what can I ask? Um, the customers that are coming to you, I appreciate some of this is sensitive, right? So, um, but the people that are coming to you, are you finding that they are? Well, you've obviously had a high net worth, um, business for a long time, right? So you have a network that is those people but it is is it though is it those people or are you find now getting a mix of people from all over the place and what are the conversations like that you're having you know first up um the conversations are literally all over the place and this is where um i know andy jake and i are thrilled to be just talking to bitcoiners and and this is i think one of the one of the big things about being a bitcoiner particularly when you're early in your journey is that it is a really lonely spot to be and one one thing that I think comes across from a lot of the clients that we talk to is they don't have anyone in their lives to really have a conversation with about Bitcoin. Like they've bored their next of kin to death or their partner, and it's like they don't have an outlet to to talk to people about this. And you know, as Bitcoiners, you know, when you discover Bitcoin and realize, oh my goodness, this can change the world, and no one in your close inner circle is listening, it's like it's almost maddening so one of the one of the huge things that has come through um to me in conversations with clients who have been in the space for a while is that they haven't had the opportunity to talk to people so just to talk to another bitcoiner has been a great thing for just for their mental health to yeah, say yeah. oh my goodness i thought i was crazy or i you know and and then one of the fun things to do is to talk to you know their partners and it's like, hey, look at this. Here's a here's another real life Bitcoiner, and they talk <laughs> and like, oh, look at this. And it's like, you know, it's it's fabulous to meet their partners and say, hey, look, you know, we're magic internet friends, sure, but we're real life people too. And you know, we've done just the amount of work that you know your partner's done, and you know, we think what they think. We think this is a great idea and a good opportunity, and we think there's a lot of upside there. And you know, basically, your your partner's not crazy. They they're onto something. And also coming from the background that you have come from, that must give particularly the partners a huge amount of relief as well. Yeah, I I, I hope that does because, yeah. you know, we share personal stories about that and, you know, similar journeys that we've gone through. And, you know, this is where, <clears throat> you know, Michael, God bless him. Um, you know, he's so timid with what his suggestions are. And this is where, you know, I've learned over the years now that when Michael suggests something, it's basically you should do this, and that's all you get from him. Hey, oh, you think I think you should do that? Yeah. And, and if there's like, any, shit, I wish any, I'd done that ten years ago when he told me. <laughs> bingo. And this is where if there's any pushback, he's like, oh well, yeah, you, you know, whatever you do, you. And, it's, <laughs> and I'm like, 
fuck, man. Like, come on. <laughs> he could have pushed a little harder for that one. <laughs> so, you know, say with Mike, you know, uh, I think everyone goes through that story and this is where sort of sharing that story with Mike and, you know, him telling me and me dismissing it, I think it's a really important point for other people to hear that, you know, I think the, you know, traditional education that I went through in finance and, you know, all of the, you know, learnings that I had in that space and, you know, thinking in from a TradFi perspective, I think were actually detrimental to my personal adoption of Bitcoin because there were so many hurdles that I had to overcome to get to the point of really understanding it because it's a technology first, not finance, whereas people, because there's a dollar value to Bitcoin, want to ascribe it as finance, not technology. And and this is where if I had spent the time to really understand the technology behind it, it would have been a much faster route to adopting it. But do you, do you look at those hurdles that you did actually end up jumping through it, uh, indicative of, I guess, more conviction because you had you had those hurdles to go through, you know what I mean? And, and you still mm. got there? Yes and no. And this is where I think it's um, probably a love for my brother and catching up with him and wanting to be interested in what he's interested was the thing that unlocked it for me. So, you know, knowing that he's got a Bitcoin business in San Francisco, he's on the other side of the world and wanting to, you know, talk to him every other day and see how he's doing and whatever, then, you know, basically the conversation ends up revolving around or, you know, if I want to keep his interest on the phone, um, revolves around basically whatever he's interested in. And that comes down to Bitcoin. So he was really patient with me. He basically gave me a world-class education on Bitcoin. And I could have found a better Bitcoiner to, you know, give me that education. And this was at a time when, you know, there weren't really the podcasts. There wasn't the education. There weren't the books. There wasn't, you know, know, hundreds, if not thousands of people basically producing content on a daily basis to help, you know, strengthen this message. So, you know, it was pretty light on. There was Andreas Antonopoulos and I watched all of that. And there was Nick Zabo on... Uh, Joe Rogan's podcast in about 2013, I think. So outside of those two resources, there wasn't really a lot. You were like scrambling around for anything that you could find, right? Literally. And then maybe there were some memes on Reddit. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. It's it's funny you say that. Like I have that same sort of situation with my own dad who is kind of, um, sorry, I'm not seeing you. Seeing you as my dad, Pete. Sorry, <laughs> um, about, you were two years and two years different, so you were you went early. Um, That's... but um, we um, so he sort of has Bitcoin, but he kind of he has Bitcoin because I have Bitcoin. He, he knows that he knows I care about it, and he know and like I've obviously tried to talk his ear off for a long yeah. time. So um, oh, here comes the dog. Um, but um, but the only real reason he has it is because I have the Bitcoin, and he wants to be involved in the conversation. And I'm like. At what point do I, what is it that I could say? I don't want him to be here for me. That's a, I know it's lovely, you know, that's a lovely thing, but I don't want him to be here for me. I want him to be here for him. Because then when we then have that, because then that is a relationship thing. It's when I, you then get to go, oh, shit. It's like, you know, when you take your kid along to, uh, you know, I don't know, let's say you're in, they're into something you're not really into. You're loving it for for them. Mm, but cool. then you finally, the first thing for me was sitting and watching the masters with my daughter who wanted to watch it. That was incredible. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Like, I just like, well, you want to be here and I want to be here. This is great because we're both getting something out of this for ourselves, but also together. That's video games for me. Right. Listen, yeah. listen, listen to you, you selfish prick. Your dad's getting plenty out of it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, he's, he's getting heaps. He gets to talk to you and hear your passion for it. That's enough for him. That's all he needs, literally. He's just yeah. looking for a way to connect. And if this is what it is, then that's what he does. He's fortunate, you know? Yeah, but I, but I need him to get it, Pierre. I need him to no, get no, it. No, you don't. You just, listen to Pete. Yeah, just, <laughs> just be grateful. He wants, to, he wants to hear about it or pretend to hear about it. He's probably, you know busy stapling his penis to a ruler because he can't stand it but you know <laughs> i'll ask i mean what can yeah. i say Dad, what are you doing now? So you, you know doing the great now? thing is hats just had that that image in his head of his dad i'll never i never, never lose it now yeah. <laughs> it's there for good um I mean, what one i'll go let's finish on this right what is yeah. what i like i'm, I'm kind of liking this just now what is really exciting you just now um in either your own business your what you're doing just now or like what you're seeing somebody else working on Oh, I'll tell you a story um, because it fundamentally gets to me, but it's going to take 
some time to get through the zeitgeist slash consciousness of Bitcoiners to get there. So um, for a long period of time, like three years, um, I've had this dream of creating an app store for keys. So as you know, we do collaborative custody and part of that collaborative custody is basically geographically distributing keys across a distributed network and basically providing a number of fail safes and redundancies built into someone's self-custody setup. And I thought the ultimate way to do this, um, you know, the way we're using it at the moment, we've got Unchained, Casa, Nunchuck, Keeper, Thea, you name it, like whatever multi-sig option you want to use, then we, we're down with. But, you know, typically that ends up being the most user-friendly. And how we set it up is the software provider has a key. So, you know, in the instance that we use Unchained, Unchained has a key, the client has a key, we hold a key. So there are multiple fail safes built into this collaborative custody that the client can lose a key and they won't lose their Bitcoin. Unchained can go and fall over and we're not going to lose the Bitcoin. You know, me and the Bitcoin advisor can fall over and the clients can sign with Unchained to replace my key. So there's, it, 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 it's quite a virtuous cycle that, we haven't lost a Bitcoin and we haven't lost a single Satoshi, which is basically perfection, but perfection is just good enough when it comes yeah. to doing yeah. what we do, right? Yeah. Um, and this is where, you know, the last three or four years in delivering this to clients in a collaborative custody format led me to um, a product idea or a service idea, which involved basically having uh, an app store for keys where you can basically plug in to this app store and there is literally hundreds, if not thousands of keys that you can choose from, from Bitcoiners all over the world. And you can effectively build your own multi-seed quorum based on reputational keys. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Brendo and Hats might have a key for the Two Bit Idiot show. And I'm like, I love this show. I listen to it. I love you guys. I trust you. I want you to be a key holder. And so in this key, in this key store, you guys say, look, we're good guys. We're going to charge you, you know, 300 bucks a year to have us as a backup key for you. Yeah. So if anything fucks out, then you guys step in and do it and you charge them 25 bucks a month. And that's cool. Um, Stefan Levera, you know, he's you know, so generous, so giving of his time and everything else. He might say he might have his key on the store and say, I'm going to charge 10 bucks a month. And he might have, a thousand. Nice. Go, go with go with Stefan. Yeah. It's a great deal. Yeah. <laughs> well, you, well, you, well, you need multiple. So yeah, this yeah, is yeah. the thing. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you boys might stand a chance. And then <laughs> this is where he might charge 10 bucks a month and he might have 10,000 clients who pay him 10 bucks a month. Yeah. Now, all of a sudden, Stefan, with his impeccable reputation and you boys too, that all of a sudden, this is a way to monetize your reputation and deliver great value to all of your fans and, you know, your listeners. All of a sudden, I'll, I'm very like, clever. well, that's what I think. I'm like, wow, this is, is awesome. And so I have shot the shit out of this idea. It's been a dream for three years. I've shot the shit out of this idea to anyone who'd listen and basically crickets. And then I was on the call with Eric Kaysen, who said, I think I need to introduce you to someone. And he introduced me to Rob Hamilton who you may or may not know. And he might be a really interesting guy to have on the, on the show, but he is... Rob or Rod? Rob? Rob, R-O-B, yep. Rob, yep. Robert. Uh, he's a really interesting guy, and he has basically built out um, effectively what I want, which is a key store for app, uh, app store for keys. Always get that around the wrong way. Anyway, um, so he has this uh, Anchor Watch is his business, and it's a phenomenal, phenomenal product. And... Literally, I was with he and Becca. Becca's the CEO or COO. He's the CEO. They gave me a product demonstration, and I literally had a tear in my eye watching this because this was my thoughts for the last three years literally visualized in front of me. Yep. And I was like, and Becca, literally, I'm like, oh, my goodness, I'm emotional watching this. This is literally everything I dreamed of. Yeah. And Becca looked at me and goes, do you have a tear in your eye? And I was thinking... Yep, I do. Like, <laughs> <laughs> but it changes quick. But, you know, this is where um, what's interesting, though, is Anchor Watch is basically designated and designed as an insurance product. Um, personally, I wouldn't go down the insurance route because it's more heavily uh, regulated than the SEC with, 
you know, the ETFs, and they're going to be, I think they're going to be working really hard for the next 10 years to deliver that product. And it's going to basically be kibosh and then picked up by the insurance industry when they're ready for it, not when mm. Anchor Watch is ready for it. And in addition to that, because it's technology, they don't need to call it an insurance product, but it can deliver the same functions of insurance. So I'm like, anyway, I won't, I won't go down that because it's a product that I absolutely love and would endorse in a heartbeat. But they've built the technology out that basically they have an app store for keys if you want it. And so yeah. building the front end of that, I'm like, oh my goodness, this is exactly what I want. That's what I want to build out. And that's what I would want to build out. But this is where um, the, say, um, the Bitcoin Maxi Puritans who are here now, which I think consider us to be, are all about not your keys, not your coins. So I come up with a little bit of resistance now and again with providing a collaborative custody yep. arrangement. You know, I think we have, we have, you know get to about 95% of satisfaction of the Maxi Puritans. Mm. And the little that we don't, I think the trade-offs are worth it because, mm. you know, we get to take the population from 0.1% of the population of adoption to, you know, a collaborative custody can basically service, I think, and promote that self-custody to 10% or 20% of the population. So we get to grow the the, the pie of adopt or the adoption rate of self-custody exponentially from where we are here. And this is where I think what's coming down the road with the App Store for Keys, collaborative custody needs to be adopted and accepted in broader terms. And then once that collaborative custody is adopted in the next bull run, the product that I just described will be the product in the next bull run. Yeah. Now, I just don't think we're ready for it yet. And it probably needs, well, probably needs a few years of testing before I really want to trust it. And this is where I'm, you know, my old school paranoia of making sure that things have worked for multiple years um, has served me really well when it comes to adopting tech in Bitcoin. That is a, a very cool idea though. Yeah, and also, man, what I like about you, I've listened to quite a number of things you've been on, and, and what I like about your messages is it's consistent in the sense of you do you, and yeah. if you're capable of doing this yourself, go yes. and do that. Yes. But if you feel that you require some assistance and you're happy to pay for a service for that assistance, to, even if it's just to start with, well, we can help you. And it's yeah. what it's doing is it's getting keys off, it's getting coins off exchange. Bingo. Yeah. That's the first, That's and that's what you're, and and it's it's kind of like it goes. It's a little bit like the podcast thing where we're talking about before. When, you know, people have maybe outgrown it. If if, if this is beyond, if you're beyond this, this is not for you. We're not talking Correct. to you. Yeah. Um. You know, if you, you're better, go and go and be better. We want you to be better. Yeah. Don't um, waste your time here. <laughs> t- totally, totally. But if that's not the case for something, that, that isn't the case for most people. We have to recognize. Correct. Yeah. Um, and and this is the thing. Ninety nine percent of the population isn't here yet. So they need this message and they need, you know, the old heads of the industry to still be here to sort of, you know, basically guide people through all of these pitfalls. Because, yeah. you know, if if the Bitcoin maxis aren't here, I guarantee you the next bull run will be full of altcoin shit and, you know, yeah. traps and, you know, scams and this and that. And this is where as the adoption rates of Bitcoin grow, I hope that a lot of the Bitcoiners don't leave the space and they stick around to basically be good shepherds and help newbies basically avoid the pitfalls of all of these scams that will inevitably resurface in a different way, shape or form. Yeah. Yeah. Because, yeah, I mean, I mean, frankly, it may be the case that your business is a terrific business for three years, five years, 10 years, and then it becomes, then the key management becomes so easy mm. correct that all of a sudden that 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 your current model is i mean you're the, the model i'm sure will change over time too but like the mm. current model is like not relevant for the market anymore and at that point you know you and andy and jake or whoever it is you know go off and do you're doing something else at that point and everybody's and everybody sure. moves on but in the meantime like i am sure there's people who had bitcoin 20 13 14 15 or something that if they if there had been that sort of a service at that time they'd probably be sitting here with a bit more bitcoin than they're currently sitting with yeah, and so, this is so thinking of those new people coming in. That's what they are. They, they, you know, uh, you know, today they're yeah. the 13, 14, 15 people. Um, how, how much um kind of hand holding does the BTC advisor do? So I've got a mate right who has been pinging me messages for two weeks because he's like just starting. So he's like, 
I'm thinking of getting in. He, he doesn't have a lot of money or he, he doesn't want to put a lot of money to start with. And But he's, he's sending me messages about cold storage. Like he's he's really looking asking into Asking the it. right questions. Asking the right yeah. questions. And yeah. I, I've already said like, like I, you know, I need to sit with you and talk and like I'll get hats as well. But like, do you guys have kind of a, a minimum, a threshold? Like what's the story there as far as um, your clients? Uh, not really, no. So this is where we obviously want to help get Bitcoins off exchange, full stop. Um, what that looks like as far as a you know uh, capacity, it's anyone's guess. Mm. Um, on a on a genuine level, I think the highest purpose that you know, and I think I can confidently speak for the three of us that Andy, Jake, and I serve is helping anyone get Bitcoins off exchange. Whether they become a client or not, I think is a secondary benefit. And this is where the collaborative custody solves a very specific problem in that typically our clients are older. Um, they might be um, sort of 50 to 60 years of age plus. They've got significant assets behind them. They've done enough work to know that they need to self-custody. And then the thought of actually doing that is terrifying and it's paralyzing. Fair because enough. they don't want to be responsible for losing, you know, the greatest asset that's ever invented or 30 or 50 or 60% of their net assets by basically getting this wrong. Yeah. And, and you know, for clients who are a little bit older, you know, they are acutely aware of, you know, what their legacy is going to be. And they're, you know, they can see the end, they can see the end of the rope. They can see the, you know, the end coming and they want to ensure that their fan, you know, their, their beneficiaries, their, estate, their wife, their children are basically looked after and the fee to pay to get that done and make sure that there nothing is going to you know interrupt that plan and their legacy is money well spent. It's basically peace of mind. And this is the sort of curious thing that I've noticed is for the clients who come on board, typically it's a very quick onboarding process. You know, they've typically watched a lot of the videos, you know, and They've seen me talk about this stuff a lot. We meet face to face. Andy's outstanding at it. He's excellent. I can't can't tell you how good he is at 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 talking with clients and you know addressing all of the concerns. But typically within a forty five minute or thirty minute window, clients are like, "Yep, that solves my problem. Send me the paperwork. We'll get this done." And <laughs> it's actually solving a need, not a want. Mm. And this is what I find and really. Um, yeah, you're Quite not shocking. you're not selling. It's reassurance that you're providing, it's, right? It, it's not. It's not. And this is where, you know, I, I'm I'm not that guy. Like I don't sit there and I'm not a hard sales guy. And hey, you've got to do this and whatever. I'm like, fuck off and leave me alone. Like <laughs> I really don't like that, right? So yeah, I, yeah. I, I sort of try and treat people how I'd like to be treated. And you know, you've got to understand that if people are in this space now, they've clearly put in a lot of time and energy and effort to get here, and their understanding of things are you know very deep. And this is where for me, there's no pressure. It's like, hey, these are the things we consider. This is the delivery. This is the outcome. Do you want it? Yes or no? If clients don't want it, I still tell them to go to the page and basically check out all of the things that we do. So if they don't want us to do it, hopefully they can implement that themselves and deliver a better outcome and make sure they don't lose any Bitcoin if they get hit by a bus tomorrow. Yep. Yep. Beautiful. So. Thank you for letting us sit in on a Dunworth family breakfast. Yeah, that was a bit. Um, uh, sorry for landing on. You thought it would be. I, I really wanted to just break your composure just for 10 seconds, just, no, like, just no. so I could screen grab it. But I d obviously didn't manage. I'm disappointed. Um, I loved it. I, I loved it. I, I thought, um, oh, wow, I should probably duck out of here so you boys can get some, you know, real, real messaging from, you know, from the man. Who did you think was coming on? I need to know that. Oh, yeah. Um, in, in the five seconds you had to think about it. Oh, maybe Mark. Mark. Fucking who, Mark. Which Mark? Yeah, I probably won't mention his surname okay, here, okay, okay. but oh. um, I've had a fabulous conversation. And it's funny, we agree on 90% or 95% of the stuff. There's just a little sticking point where I think, and, yeah. and this is to your point about, um, you mentioned something earlier where we didn't really address it. You said, um, with the you know the sky high valuations that Bitcoin's going to go to, does that suck the equity and the value out of the existing markets and take it into Bitcoin? Yep. 
Personally, I don't think that happens. What I think happens is you're thinking of it as a balloon and Bitcoin's got a tiny little bit of air in it now and you're thinking, if I'm right, you squeeze this balloon and you squeeze the equity out of the existing assets and bonds, whatever, and it basically goes into the Bitcoin space. Is that right? Uh, largely right. I just, my, my question is kind of, about the gradient of the line. Okay. So I've got a completely different concept of that. Go on then. So what I look at and think is, say we've got $2,000 trillion worth of value that needs to be accounted for now, and Bitcoin is half a trillion dollars. Just to get to the size of the existing market now, Bitcoin can go up 4,000 times. But I don't think Bitcoin goes up 4,000 times. I think it goes up 4 million times and it's going to take grow the pie exponentially. Mm -hmm. So nowhere is going to come out of these markets that we're used to. There's just going to be a new class of ultra wealthy people who are called Bitcoiners. Mm -hmm. And so the pie is going to be rather than 2000 trillion, the pie is going to grow exponentially and it's going to continue growing. And all of a sudden Bitcoin is going to basically assume $2 million trillion worth of value and the $2,000 trillion worth of value in bond stocks and property will remain here. Now, why would that happen? Is because price is determined at the margin and people will value optionality of having Bitcoin because Bitcoin is represents the greatest optionality that you can have in an asset. It can purchase everything else, but everything else can't purchase Bitcoin. So for that reason, we're going to have the majority of wealth stored in Bitcoin over and above what exists in the real world because people are going to want to have that optionality to buy real world stuff whenever they want to. So the pie grows exponentially. Oh, Pete, you're a sweetheart. You were just throwing some bullish fucking shit in just at the end for us. <laughs> just to wake you guys up. Cause oh, I'm, yes. I'm, I'm getting low energy from you. Come on. <laughs> uh, love it, man. Perfect ending. Man. All right, man. Um, well, Let's stay, stay there. We'll we'll talk some. We'll talk golf. You always we'll, do that. No, no, no. We'll talk to Pete Golf. I, I we'll say goodbye to the listeners, and we're gonna we're gonna arrange a golf day. He's just so paranoid awesome. about about like stopping recording and people hanging up. I love it, boys. Thank you. All right, mate. Thank you, buddy. Cheers. Goodbye, but not really. <laughs>